Good afternoon, everybody. I think this is working. It is. Um, thank you so much for coming. We really appreciate you giving up your time, um, especially Cameron, who will chat to you in a moment. My name's Fiona. I'm from Student Life, um, the wellbeing section of Student Life. And we're really thrilled to be bringing you this masterclass series um, based on information you gave us last year. So firstly, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of the land that we're meeting on today, the Wajap Noongar people, who remain um, the spiritual and cultural custodians of their land. Uh, so as I mentioned, we did a survey, an all of uh, university survey last year. We had thousands of university students complete it, um, which was fantastic. And we took some of your top wellbeing issues from that survey, and that's what we've started with this week. Um, we did sleep on Monday, mindfulness yesterday, and Cameron is going to be presenting some inf great information about some um, unhelpful thinking styles or helpful thinking styles today. So our wellbeing blocks are our way of summarising the framework which we launched in May. We hope that it's a very easy um, way of thinking about your own wellbeing and some of the um, building blocks you can put in place to maintain and enhance your wellbeing before you might get to the point of needing help. Take notice is what Cameron is going to be focusing on today um, and a great uh, little mini way of doing that is to switch your phones onto silent, pop them out of your eye line. It's very, very hard. We're all so busy in our minds to stop frequently and take notice and hopefully um, by doing that you'll walk out feeling really energised as well today by learning a new skill. Alrighty. Thank you, Fiona. Um, Welcome everyone, I want to thank you all for taking some time out of your really busy day. Is that too loud? Okay, perfect. Um, before we get into today, just hands up, who struggles with unhelpful thinking styles? I know I do, especially on a Friday when I've got lots of work to do after this. I'm kind of worrying a little bit. Um, what sort of unhelpful thinking styles do you guys normally struggle with? Just pop out, feel free to speak. Yes? Perfectionism. Perfectionism, yes, I'm <laughs> I relate to that. Anyone else? Yeah, for sure. I'm a catastrophizer, a, a what if kind of man. So, anyone else want to share? Yes. Yeah, big one. Big one. Ruminating a little bit. Yeah, for sure. When I originally came up with the idea for this presentation, I was surfing the web to see for what was sort of out there, and I didn't want to make this cookie cutter. I didn't want to make this about how you can notice your unhelpful thinking and change your thoughts. I thought, well, what do the students actually need? And part of that is noticing not only when we're going into those unhelpful thinking patterns, but more, how can we be flexible towards our thinking as opposed to try to change every single negative thought that we might have? So that's the real point about today, is to not view negative thoughts as bad things, as things we need to eliminate, but more, how can we change our thinking style to be more flexible and assist in our studies. We'll actually make this as practical as we can with some techniques and I'll give you handouts for you guys to grab after this if you'd like. So feel free to grab them after the presentation and any questions you might have just raise your hand I'm happy to answer as we go along and we'll take it from there. All right. Any questions before we get started? No? Good. Well why are thoughts so important to us? Well to put it simply when we're really stressed or distressed our brain tends to favor coping strategies, particularly thinking coping strategies, that immediately reduce what we're feeling. And most of the time, 95%, we're pretty good at it, to be honest. We don't need to see a psychologist or a counselor. We don't even need to speak to friends. We're able to pick up what we're feeling, problem solve, and move forward. However, when we encounter situations that are sudden, unexpected, overwhelming, our thinking changes dramatically. And it has a really profound effect on how we act, how we feel, how we sense, and ultimately how we navigate into an adjustment period. And it comes with this really, really simple understanding that if one psychological system is activated, it's going to influence all the other systems. So, for instance, who here has done a group assignment? I've done one. Who here has been frustrated with their group members? <laughs> I have. We might feel that frustration. We might feel it in our body, tense, overwhelmed. We might feel like we're not going to get it in, we're going to fail. Then the thinking starts. And before you know it, we're either being perfectionists or trying to do all the work ourselves, or not doing the work at all and expecting a good grade. That's really rigid processes of how we get overwhelmed in our psychological functioning. 
So I'm not going to go over these too much because it's not really the purpose of today, but we touched on it just before. I'm a catastrophizer. Does anybody else have some more uncommon, unhelpful thinking styles? Self-critical bias is a big one as well, I think, with the guilt. Yeah. If we were to go through every single style of unhelpful thinking that you have, you'd probably be here for the rest of your life trying to change them. Um, it would make good money for psychological services, but for you guys it actually wouldn't give you as much agency as you need. More generally, and the way that we're going to work today is understanding that overthinking patterns tend to come in two kinds of forms. The warriors, so all about the future, anxiety, fear, threat detection, the what-ifs of our thinking patterns. What if that happens? What if I don't get that assignment in? What if I'm overwhelmed? What happens if I fail a unit? It's that constant spiral towards the future and not being in that present moment. Some of us are ruminators. We sit there and we brood over the past, trying to learn from our mistakes. The I should have done that, I would have done that, I could have done that, I can't, I must. It's these locked patterns of thinking about, OK, I'm going to learn from the past. Some of us are both. There's no right or wrong to this. It's just a case of figuring out what kind of thinker you are. So show of hands, who's a, who's a warrior? I'm a warrior. Casey's a warrior. <laughs> who's a ruminator? I'm a ruminator. <laughs> who's a bit of both? I'm a bit of both. Good. So as I was doing the presentation and kind of going through it, I got locked into this pattern of trying to change your thoughts. And it was so rigid, I thought, no, nah, I've got to start all over. So I started all over last week. And it came from this experience of a client who was talking me through how they're being more flexible in their thinking, coming up with many different problem-solving options and testing them out. And a light bulb turned on, and I thought, well, let me Google flexibility. Let me have a look at some of the literature out there. And I think that's really important is cognitive flexibility. It's what we call a transdiagnostic process. Big fancy word for it helps all the other things in our psychological functioning work better. We think of cognitive flexibility as something really simple, but it's something incredibly complex. It involves our ability to create different kinds of solutions to a problem in our thinking. It involves problem solving, so not only applying those new creative solutions, but also stopping our old unhelpful patterns from happening. And then it's a sense that we're in control of our thinking, a sense that it doesn't dominate us. We, in fact, have agency around how we think. So it's a little bit more complex than just being flexible. It's a little bit more about engine oil in a car. It's not in and of itself going to help the car run, but it is going to help the car run at its optimum temperature, at its optimum efficiency. So does anybody have any questions about flexibility? Does it kind of make sense? On the opposite end of the spectrum, cognitive rigidity is this idea that we find it incredibly difficult to stop our unhelpful thinking patterns, our perfectionistic thinking, our worry, our rumination. And we lock ourselves into these patterns time and again. We don't have the ability to stop. So has anybody ever had the experience of picking up that they've worried for a couple of hours and they haven't done their assessment? Because I know I've done that. I've just picked up and I'm like, where did I go? You know, we lose time, we lose hope, we lose the fact that thoughts are just thoughts. So rigidity is not just about being stationary, it's also losing that sense of control in our thinking. The way I look at rigidity, because I'm a bit of a metaphorist, is it's like going down a train track on a dead end time and time again and repeating that over and over, expecting a different outcome. Rigidity stops us from changing tracks or changing trains or not being on the train at all. So why is it important? I'm not going to go through these studies, but cognitive flexibility is something we call a mediator. So it mediates things from happening, both positive and negative. So on the positive scale, it helps us be better problem solvers. It helps us be better thinkers, creative thinkers. It helps with our communication style. Those are all pretty big things when it comes to being a student. You need to problem solve. You need to be creative. You need to manage your time effectively. You need to communicate effectively. So being cognitively flexible really helps with those sort of things. On the flip side, rigidity is kind of the opposite. It mediates things like 
developing anxiety, depression, PTSD, even eating disorders for that matter. It acts as almost an accelerant for those things coming into our lives, if that's what you struggle with. For you guys as students, can I just get a little sense of, are you first year students, second year students, post-grad? Where are you guys at with your studies? Diplomas? Oh, welcome. <laughs> Anyone else? Where are you guys from? First year, second semester? Or, or welcome. <laughs> Four weeks. How are you finding it? Good. Do we have any second years or third years yet? And how are you guys finding the experience? of uni. Good? You like it? I don't think people realize because in the media you see university students as the lazy, get lots of holiday kind of people. Mm -mm. You guys face stresses and experiences that are far beyond the norm of what we expect in the Aussie population. Things like adjusting to a new country, adjusting to a language, adjusting to studies at the tertiary level for the first time. Finding the tab, finding the best coffee, it's rocket fuel, <laughs> just I want hack a draft. Wouldn't recommend the Reed Library coffee, not great. Uh, <laughs> but really, really importantly, even within those transitions, it's also how we adapt our thinking in the micro moments. Like for instance, you guys are going to have many, many assessments all due on the same day. You might have a quiz, an assessment, how do you balance your time between all of those? A lot of us have to work when we're at university, we don't get that capacity just to study. A lot of us have to navigate complex family relationships and personal relationships. And this all requires us to be as flexible as we can. Now importantly, I think you guys do this really well already. This is more just a tune-up presentation to help you maybe try a few things you hadn't considered before. So who here thinks that negative thoughts are an issue? Who thinks they're bad and we need to stop them? OK, we've got one, two, three, four, five. Peer pressure's getting everyone <laughs> in a little bit of trouble here. <laughs> I think most of us would have had the belief that negative thoughts aren't good for us. But believe it or not, without negative thoughts, we wouldn't be here. Number one, they're a survival mechanism. We need to actually be negatively biased in our day-to-day -day lives because it's helped us get to this point. COVID-19 taught me that really, really well, that to think optimistically and future-based about the world and then like that, it just disappears. You know, sometimes we need to think negatively. We need to allow ourselves to feel those thoughts. So if negative thoughts aren't the issue, what might be the issue? I couldn't come up with the answer if I'm honest. And then I realized that I practice the answer every single day through a type of therapy called metacognitive therapy. And metacognitive therapy isn't about trying to change your negative thought patterns. It's not about trying to get rid of them. It's not even trying to avoid them. It's embracing negative thoughts as an everyday part of life. They become an issue and a pattern when we give time and attention to those thoughts every single day. We pull them closer, we push them away, and that'll become clear in a moment. So negative thoughts, that's the key for today. They're good. Think negatively. It's how we address those negative thoughts through our psychological energy that's important. We talked a little bit about worry and rumination being patterns that we all experience, but are they rigid? By their very definition, they're rigid. Like I said, we sometimes find ourselves in these hour-long spirals of the past or the future, and we lock ourselves into those spirals. And we find it really difficult to get back on task. Like, there have been some days when I was at university where I'd be so far down a worry spiral, I forgot what assessment I was trying to do, you know? It, it really is that rigid locking yourself into a pattern time and time again. Metacognitive therapy teaches us that negative thoughts just are. And to give them time and attention means to give them power and to make yourself rigid. Instead, we need to learn ways of just acknowledging a thought for what it is and moving past it. So this is your turn to share. Who here has any ideas about how their worry and rumination might help them in life? What are some positives about worry or rumination? Yes. So for the presentation, worry helps with our motivation and getting action in place. Good. Anything else? Um, 
Yeah, common. So we avoid mistakes by learning from them if we ruminate. Yeah. Any other positives? Yes. I've never heard that. That's really interesting. Thank you. So it shows how much you care. Yeah, for sure. Anyone else? Sometimes I feel like worry helps me be prepared. Like if I worry about every situation, I'll be prepared and I can deal with it. What about negatives? What are some negative outcomes when we worry? Yeah, for sure. For sure. You worry in the sense that you're preoccupied about something. You've got a plan maybe for the future, for example. That's a positive, but if it pulls you down negatively, it's not going to be good, not even for your nervous system. No, exactly. 100%. What are some other negatives? It causes an action. You worry about something you can't do. So it can cause an action, for sure. I once had the worry that I'm going crazy, you know. I'm worrying so much I must have a clinical anxiety disorder. I'm worrying myself sick into that mental illness stage. Anyone else? Who here thinks that they control their worry, that they have full 100% control over worry and rumination? Who here thinks that it controls them? Who here doesn't know? Now you might be thinking, what's with the pink elephant? And I'll demonstrate that in a moment. What happens so implicitly when we go into a spiral is, I want us to all imagine we're at the beach with one of those pink beach balls. You know those really like horrible cheap ones you buy from Kmart, about $10? I want that to represent a negative thought. And you're in the water, you're playing with the beach ball. What happens at the metacognitive level is, we bring that beach ball closer because we think it's positive for us. I'm going to be prepared, it's going to help me be motivated, it's going to help me to action things. So then we start the worry and the rumination. But soon we realize, oh, this is actually really negative for me. It leads to inaction, it's not good for my anxiety, it's not good for my nervous system. I don't control it. So as human beings, we suppress. We're master suppressors. So we put the beach ball underwater. We can only hold that for so long, and I want us all to do one thing. Don't think of a pink elephant right now. What are we all doing? Yeah, we're all thinking of a pink elephant. That's the power of suppression. The minute we tell ourselves not to do something, it happens straight away. So that beach ball pops back up in the water, but hey, we think it's positive. So what do we do? We do more of it. We realize it's negative and we can't control it, so we push it under, try to suppress it. But hey, don't think of the pink elephant. Pops back up. Same pattern repeats over and over again from one little negative thought. But the negative thought didn't do anything, it's just a negative thought. It's not the issue, it's how you guys are pulling negative thoughts closer to do it because you believe it's good, and then suppressing it when you realize it's bad for you, you can't control it. That's really important. Do you guys understand that? It's a bit of a different way of thinking, but does it make sense? Yeah? Does anybody have any questions about it? Good. I won't go too much into this slide, but this is basically what's happening in the metacognitive space. So what happens is, where are we? We have unhelpful attention, so we latch on to negative thoughts really, really well. Then we believe it's good, so we do more of it. So we go into that positive, where is it? Positive beliefs about worry and rumination. Then we realize it's dangerous and uncontrollable, so we suppress it or we avoid it or we jump on TikTok, YouTube, we clean, we suppress through our behaviors, we do all kinds of unhelpful things. We perfectionize, so we overcompensate. But all that does is bring our attention to the negative thought, because they haven't gone away. They come every single moment of the day. And it's through these repetitive, like, petal cycles that we find ourselves trapped in these rigid beliefs of worrying being good for us or rumination being good for us. So this is the first strategy. Who yet practices mindfulness? Anybody? Yes? And what have you learned from your mindfulness experiences? Yeah. Great. So it lets things flow through. I think that's really important. Does it help with your attention? Yeah. 
Excellent. I think people believe attentions like this. You hold it for hours on end and you sit there in front of the computer and you do your assessments and you study like this. But attention is more about noticing when we've drifted and having the confidence to curiously bring it back to what we're doing and repeating that process time and again so our attention becomes stronger. So when we're worried, what we're actually doing is holding our attention in one space, the worry and rumination space. So attention training, starting to build awareness of when you're going into unhelpful thinking patterns is really important. So thank you for sharing mindfulness. That's a great way. Meditation, yoga, breathing, all of those things help. But I don't have any time in my day to do those things. So what do we do? We pick a boring task. So name some boring tasks you guys do every day. I, I hate vacuuming, but I, I do it every weekend. Anything else? Yes. Making the, bed. making the bed. I don't make my bed. <laughs> but yes, making the bed for sure. Brushing our teeth is a common one. I don't think people realize how boring brushing your teeth can be. Hygiene practices, even eating breakfast. You do these things every day, but we don't do them mindfully. These are perfect opportunities to train your attention, or at least begin to train your attention. And how it kind of works is you just mindfully describe and experience what it's like to brush your teeth in the morning. Brushing my teeth on the left side, noticing the feeling of the toothpaste. Got to get that assignment in on Friday. Oh, my attention's drifted. I'm going to bring it back to now I'm in the middle of my teeth and I'm still in that circular motion. It feels cool and calm, really enjoying this. Oh, I've got work tomorrow. Hey, my, my attention's just drifted. I need to come back to now I'm on the right side. And it's an easy way to start practicing the noticing of when your attention has drifted. So I'd really encourage that, guys. There's a handout on how to do that. Um, so don't worry about recording any of this, but it's really important that if you can do it every day, that's really going to help you to pick up when you're going into your worry and rumination spirals. For me, though, the most powerful tool that I use as a metacognitive therapist is something called postponement. And postponement, believe it or not, is more about changing our attitudes towards our overthinking than it is changing the negative thoughts themselves like a strategy. So what postponement is, is curiously and openly acknowledging when a negative thought or worry has popped into our mind, saying hello to it, but then putting it in a designated time to come up with a plan for it. And repeating this process time and time and time again, because you have hundreds of thoughts a day, if not thousands, retraining your brain to form a new neural circuit that can help be more flexible as opposed to rigid like worry and rumination is. Does that kind of make sense to you guys? It's more of an attitude than a strategy? Yes? Yeah, really great, really great question. Suppression is number one more rigid than postponement. So if we look at the definition of flexibility, suppression is I've got to do this, I've got to do this. Postponement is if you're important enough, I'll come up with a plan for you later on. So we're developing that sense of control. We're also developing alternative solutions to our negative thinking. So we're not just locking ourselves into suppression. We're saying, I've got control over you, and there will be options for me to deal with you down the line. And number two, it, it stops us from the negative pattern, really importantly. But thank you for your question. Excellent question. So... How do we postpone? The first thing we need to do is you guys need to find a designated thinking time. 30 minutes a day, that's all you get to worry from now on, okay? Or ruminate, you've got 30 minutes. So how many hours a day do you guys estimate you roughly ruminate right now? Or worry? Who's more than one hour? I'm more than one hour. Two hours? Three hours? Okay, not bad. But you've got 30 minutes from this point on, which is a little bit different. It's really important that in your thinking time, you try to set something that's a little bit consistent. So a lot of my clients set it at about 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock at night. Um, some of my clients decide to do it in the morning. It just depends on your lifestyle, guys, so be flexible with that. Um, but really important, it just can't be before bed. Because if you try to do it before bed when you first start out, you will go into a worry spiral. <laughs> okay. And we don't want that. We want to sort of learn this technique with as much positivity as we can. 
Secondly, you need to go out and buy an A5, A6 little notebook, and it's called your postponement notebook. You don't need to do this for the rest of your life, but when you first start out, it's really important to have something concrete and structured that can help you. And what it basically looks like is every time you have a worry or a rumination or a negative thought, we say to ourselves, ah, there's that negative thought. I'm going to come to that at my thinking time at 5 o'clock. So what we do is we write that little thought down. For instance, I had the worry before I came here, am I going to run out of time today? So I would write down time management. I'll come to that when I have my thinking time at 5 o'clock. That same thought's going to pop up, so we put a little tick next to it. And you're going to have hundreds of ticks when you first start out. That's all right. We have hundreds of negative thoughts a day. Every time you have that, you need to record it because you need to remember what to go through in your thinking time. What you'll soon find out as you postpone, some things need to be addressed on the spot. Like, for instance, I forgot to pay my phone bill yesterday. I need to pay my phone bill right now. I can't postpone that. That's not really practical. Um, it's really important that your attitude towards your negative thoughts is positive and curious because you don't want to go into that spiral of trying to bring it closer or suppress it. What we really want to try to do is, ah, hello, negative thought, I see you, I'll come to you when I have time. What to do in your thinking time? Well, what do you guys think would happen if you had to worry about every single thing you've worried about throughout the day in 30 minutes? Would it be possible? No. Would it be practical? No. You probably end up worrying or ruminating for another three hours. So when you come to your negative thoughts and your worries throughout the day, those that don't need your time and attention, just scratch them off. Don't even give them the consideration. For those that do need some time and attention, come up with an active plan. So I'll talk you through that in a moment. And for those that can't be solved or don't have a plan, we postpone. Now, a lot of my clients say, isn't that just avoiding the issue? No, what we're doing at the neuroscientific level is we're creating a new pathway in your brain. And we're stopping the old rigid pathway from firing so quickly. Because if something is that big of an issue, it means we actually don't have as much control over it as we might think. So that's something to postpone. Take COVID-19, for instance. We can't control that. It's a pandemic. It is what it is. But a lot of people got caught up in trying to manage COVID as an experience as opposed to themselves within that experience. So if it's too big of a worry, postpone. It will extinguish itself eventually. Does anybody have any questions about postponement or anything they'd like to share? Does anybody do this already? Okay. So how do you do it? Because um, I'm always interested to learn. So. Yeah. So in that part time before reading the Bible, I'll just like try to have it focus back to the before. This is not realistic, so I cross that out. And sometimes I try to add back to it by just making it. Excellent. Now that's what we want. That's excellent. Thank you for sharing. Anyone else think they do it or they might try it now? Not uh, like uh, procrastination. No, really good question though. Um, it can feel like procrastination because you're avoiding a negative thought. But remember, it's more about being in control of when you think about the stresses in your life. Knowing that those beach balls on that beach are just going to come because that's what we do. We have negative thoughts. So it's not avoidance. Avoidance would be more like, oh, I'm going to not do my uni work for a couple of days and come to it at the last minute. That would be procrastination or avoidance. And again, it's quite rigid, so, but excellent observation. So some com common pitfalls that I've... Uh, before we go in, I did include this slide, which I apologize. Um, I think we can email the slides. We'll have them um, as a video. Okay, excellent. I'll add a slide to this um, before we upload it, but um, this will be on the recording. Active planning is a way of you dealing with your stresses in everyday life. And what worry and rumination does is it convinces us that it's the thing that resolves our issues. There's no clinical evidence that suggests worry and rumination is positive for working memory, problem solving, communication, dealing with issues, reducing stress, helping with preparedness, helping with learning. 
nothing in the clinical literature. I've been practicing it for about three years. So I've really tried to look for it, but I just can't find anything. What actually resolves our issues and reduces our stress, if you remember that first slide, it's about thoughts, feelings, sensations, behaviors, is our ability to get over the stressor that we're dealing with. And a way of doing that is with active coping. And active coping is a six-part process. Um, and there's a handout here from, for you guys, so it goes step by step, so don't panic if, if you don't remember this, it's all there. Um, active coping is about, number one, describing what your situation is. What's the problem? Define it. Number two is about coming up with all the creative solutions that you possibly can. And I'm talking about the left of field ones. Like, for instance, if you're overwhelmed in your studies, defer your studies. Go on a six-month holiday, return when you're ready. You know, stop uni altogether, work full-time. I thought about that. Fly and fly out salaries are through the roof at the moment. $150,000 to clean. I'll do that. No problems. Be creative with it. There's no right or wrong. You haven't gotten to that point yet. After you've creatively come up with all your solutions, then you prioritize what those solutions are. One to ten, I would probably recommend ten solutions for a problem if it's a big one. Maybe a few less if it's something that you can deal with in the moment. And from there, it's about, okay, well, of the priorities, which one feels most to me? What do I actually need to do with it? So we plan it out. We execute. So that's step five. And then finally, we evaluate. Did the plan work? And it's through that process that you'll realize, oh, my worry and rumination is not what's helping me here. It's me dealing with the issues that I have at hand. And we can kind of imagine that from the point of view of assessments. Assessments require us to come up with active coping plans. We need to develop what the structure of the assessment is going to be. If it's wrong, we need to redo sections. We need to reference properly. It's all, you do this all already. This is more just formalizing it for personal life experiences. Some pitfalls with, post, um, with postponement is, number one, the drive to be perfect from day one. Um, I'm going to let you in on a secret. You're going to be shocking postponers when you first start. You're going to be terrible. Okay? I was terrible. All my clients are terrible. That's not an issue. It's about that attitude change as opposed to being perfect at a strategy. So be kind to yourselves. You're not going to be perfect. It's about learning that skill as you go along. Number two, we're going to worry on paper when we first start. So some people come up with 10, 15 plans for one worry. That's worrying on paper. That's worrying in behavioral disguise. So we want to just be mindful of that. A good plan normally comes up with itself in a couple of minutes. Again, seeing postponement as a strategy as opposed to an attitude, we really want this to be an attitude shift because that's flexible as opposed to do strategy one, do strategy two. That's a little bit more rigid. Thinking time doesn't mean overthinking time. So Again, you've got to come up with plans for your worries. You can obviously use those plans in other times, but you, overthinking is just going to create those spirals again. And then finally, it's the attitude of a postponer. A postponer is curious and open. It's not negative. It's not positive. It's just, hey, I've got negative thoughts. What do I need to do about them? That's all. So does anybody have any questions so far? So I'm going to do some shameless promotion because that's the end of the presentation from the practical standpoint. Um, does anybody know about the counselling and psychological services? I obviously do. No? Okay. Yes, you do. Okay, so not too many people. So I'll give you just the broad stroke. So um, at the federal level, it's a requirement by law for all universities to have a counselling and psychological service, and UWA is no different. So... Um, we call it CAPS, and that's where I work. I'm one of the psychologists on staff there. And we're really dedicated to helping students with a variety of issues. This includes overthinking, stress management, personal relationships, sexuality concerns, adjustment. We also deal with the more pointy end, so clinical anxiety and depression. We deal with things like adjustment disorders, self-esteem, all those things that are more towards the, the riskier point, if you want to call it that. Um, there's no right or wrong in it, but it is really important to know that that support's out there. Um, we've adopted something called uh, a model, if you want to call it that, but it's a three-pathway model. The first is counselling, so all students have access to free sessions throughout the year. You have up to three for counselling. And people say that that's not enough. 
you can get a lot of good work done in three sessions, and a lot of students only need three appointments. Is it the best? We can always do more, and we would welcome your feedback on that, but in my personal experience, students sit at about the two, three range for most concerns. For students that feel that they might need some longer term care, we've got a psychology pathway coming in where you'll work with a psychologist and a doctor to address some of the issues that you're facing and get into full recovery, hopefully. And students can access a further six sessions on top of the three counseling sessions. So hopefully when this is all implemented, you guys can access up to nine sessions free of charge, fully confidential. And we don't just help with mental health. It's always a good place just to come and talk. We help with special considerations, referrals. We help you understand what's going on if you don't know. Like I said, it's, it's more of a touch base with the support if you feel you need it. If you don't, that's fine as well. It's an open door. Yes? Yeah, so the, um, in a moment I'll talk about the, the pathways. No, 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 that's all right, but I like the enthusiasm. Thank you. Um, the final one, something called the care and assessment team. So um, I, won't, I won't try to sugarcoat this. The care and assessment team is for students that are more at risk to themselves or the community. So if you're experiencing suicidal thoughts, thoughts of self-harm or hurting others, if you're on medication and you've gone through some changes and you're struggling with that, the care and assessment team can offer more intense support. So it's a group of psychologists and mental health nurses who work with doctors to get you to a point where you can re-engage in counseling or re-engage in your studies if that's what you need. Um, there's no limit on sessions per se, but it's really about helping you to stabilize and get to a point where you're functioning again, back and enjoying life and having some meaning in it. Um, for psychology and the care and assessment, you'll need a referral from your doctor. So there's a medical service free on, on staff here at, at UWA, so feel free to come on in. Um, how you can access uh, many, many different pathways. So number one, our reception team is located in the um, medical center, so the level two of the guild space, um, the guild building. So you can pop on in and book an appointment that way. Um, if that's not convenient for you guys, feel free to call us on 64882423. Um, if it goes to voicemail, just leave your details and our reception team will call you back. Um, and then finally, for counselling, you can just jump online and book the appointment online if you like. So you can pick the therapist of your choice, you can pick the time, the date, you can manage your appointment. So if you need to cancel, you don't need to call. You can jump online and cancel it yourself. We'll get a notification. Um, if you need to change it, you can change it. You can access a whole bunch of resources on there as well. So it's nice and flexible and yeah, it's just a really great way of doing it online. Does that, yeah, yes, Fiona. Yeah, for sure. So um, we have no preference. I think we learned in COVID-19 times that actually telehealth is really, really convenient for students. And at the end of the day, you are the guys that's most important in the process. So if you want to do telehealth, it's available at all times. If you want face-to-face, -face, we obviously have face-to-face. Um, we have a, I'll say we have a range of clinicians. There's one male, myself, and then female clinicians. But I think it is a good range of different experience levels, different lived experiences, different modalities. Um, you'll find the person that's right for you. And we'll, we'll make sure that if you have any questions about that, we can answer it. Um, some other things. I, I would encourage students to book in early. Um, all too often, we see clients that are at crisis point. So it's end of semester assignments haven't been handed in, and your mental health has made a genuine impact on that. Unfortunately, we can only go off how we know you guys. So if you come in early, we've built that rapport, that relationship. We know how you guys track, so we know it would be out of character to struggle with your studies. But if you come in at the end of the semester, we don't have that background. So even if it's just for one appointment, come on in early. Um, our peak times tend to be around week six onwards. Um, so still some time, we've still got availability, same week, so pop on in. Um, and yeah, any questions about booking in or the service or? Some APA references, I won't bore you with those. Um, questions, any questions whatsoever, not related to anything else that we've done, anything I can help with? Yes. So number one, we haven't set up the psychology pathway just yet. So it's happening this semester. 
Um, I can't make any promises because I don't want to sort of put you that in the position. But what will normally happen is you'll have a discussion with your clinician and then from there um, you'll make a decision of go to the doctor, get a, something called the mental health care plan. So that's the doctor coming up with a plan for you to work towards recovery and then they refer to us and then the government pays your session so there's no charge. Um, if you feel like you need more than nine sessions a year, we'll talk about external referrals and we have connections in the community for that. So, yeah, good. Thank you for your question. Anything else? Yes. Um, I'm going to take the shotgun approach with this. So for people who didn't hear that on the presentation, it was how do you prevent thinking time from becoming overthinking time? Um, set yourself alarms. So when you start your thinking time at 5 and 5.30, and when you hear that alarm, no matter how difficult it is to come out of that spiral, it's about getting up, you moving your body, and kind of circumventing that overthinking then and then knowing that you've got to postpone until the next day to get to your thinking time. Um, it sounds really difficult, I, I really know, because it's, and again, it's not about being perfect, but as you become familiar with it, you'll realize that you actually do have a lot of control over overthinking. Um, some other things to consider is, if you do find you're overthinking in your thinking time, change it up a little bit. Maybe change the time, maybe change the, um, the specific way that you, you use your thinking time, so do you need to go into your room instead of being in the lounge? Um, changing your environment can sometimes help with that as well. But great question. Anything else? No? Well, I'll leave it there. Um, we finished a little bit early, so I'll be hanging around for about five, ten minutes if anybody wants to ask a more personal question. Um, feel free to grab the handouts, guys, and there's a link there to the CCI. They have some great resources on metacognitive therapy as well. Yes? And before you go, we would really appreciate some feedback. Um, I came up with this idea on my own, and I'm not a student anymore. So you guys are what dictates what we present. We'd really like it. Good, bad, negative, positive, anything in between. There's some QR codes on your table as well if you can't scan it in. Um, no pressure to do it as well, but yeah, really appreciate the feedback. Um, um, and I just like to say, as Cameron mentioned, as one of our registered psychologists in the counselling team, he's incredibly busy with a very busy workload. So for all to show our appreciation. Oh, no, no. <laughs> but I want to I wanna thank everyone for taking some time out of your very, very busy schedules. I know that sometimes uni can get the best of us, so it really is appreciated for you to give up 45 minutes to an hour of your time. Um, I hope you enjoy the semester. If you ever have a question, I'm in Shenton House. So Shenton House is where the living room is. Um, there's therapy dogs on Wednesdays. I'm normally there on Wednesdays, so pop on in. All right. <laughs> Thanks, guys. No worries. Sorry, I'm going to turn this off.